It's good to be with you this afternoon. Um, there's some topics that I've dove into a lot in my research lab, as well as in some of the work I've done with the players that I've analyzed. Uh, some common questions I think we get from a lot of our users and people as it comes to ground reaction forces. And so I want to talk about a couple of those today. Mainly it's, a, I think, a little bit more information as it relates to impulse and some information as it relates to how things move in this horizontal plane of motion. Okay? So again, as a teacher, I, I do think it's important that we set up a few definitions. So I'll kind of start out with just a few definitions, make sure we're all on the same page. And then I want to get right into some swing examples, some things that you can actually look for in the players you're working with in the data to understand how that's going to influence the body motion, the positions you're used to, uh, as well as some of those TrackMan numbers if you're using TrackMan as well. Okay, so I want to start out, one of the common questions at least I get is, you know, why do we call things certain things in biomechanics? And I think unfortunately, you might have found that you might watch one video or, or see one company that describes something a certain way, and it can confuse you a little bit, and even us, when we're talking about the same thing, we're just talking about it in a little different context. So, I've got a picture here of an individual, and, and the way we can think about rotation is we really should be talking about torques as they are created around axes. So I could actually put a, a, a drop of pencil right through the tip of my head all the way down to the ground, and that would be my vertical axis. Now with that vertical axis, it would kind of also cut me in a top and bottom half that we would call my horizontal plane. And so when we're talking about those types of rotations that we see in the, back, in the golf swing, both away from the target and towards the target, we could talk about those as a torque around the vertical axis or a vertical torque, or we could call them a horizontal plane rotational force, or it's how we can take this horizontal plane and spin it around. Now I have a picture here of a player where we can kind of get this yellow overall vector as somewhat of a representation of this vertical axis and start to think about some of the rotations that occur around this axis. That's what we would call vertical torque. Okay, the reason why I think that's important is because we now can start to think about what are the forces that are gonna help create that torque. Now, the two main components that create that torque are our anterior, posterior ground reaction forces. We need to understand anterior means positive or towards the ball, posterior means negative or away from the ball. So this is one of my favorite views that I see in the Smart to Move app, where you can see how these feet are actually pushing in different directions. The lead leg creating a ground reaction force that's away from the ball or negative, and the trail leg creating a ground reaction force that's pointed towards the ball or a positive ground reaction force. Together, that's how we're creating that really powerful rotation that we see in the golf swing. Okay, another way we can look at this is actually in uh, the graph form of this app itself. Again, anytime I'm above the line, that's a positive. So trail leg positive, lead leg negative. And again, together we can create that powerful force couple where both of those feet are trying to create that rotation that we see in the golf swing. Okay, now this is an area uh, that really what we need to start to understand is not just those forces and when they peak and how big they are, that's for sure a big part of the puzzle, but I like to dive into something uh, that we call impulse. Now the best way to describe impulse is just how we apply that force over a period of time. And so I basically can look at these two graphs and say, what's the actual area under the curve? What's the shaded red versus the shaded blue? And I can actually do something where I calculate what's called a net impulse. Okay, net impulse is something that's really important because when I combine these two together over the same time period, I can start to understand, is my net impulse positive? Meaning it's gonna create a tendency of motion towards the target or is my impulse negative, which is creating a tendency of motion away from the target. Okay, I can do the same thing with my torque graph. And I think this is one that's really important to understand as we look at our players and torque graph. Okay, so anytime we see that graph under the zero, that's gonna signify a tendency of motion or rotation away from the ball, away from the target. Anytime that graph is above the zero, that's gonna signify a tendency of motion towards the target. But what becomes really important in these two graphs 
is what happens to that net impulse. Because as I look at the very best players that come through my lab, they're able to create more positive torque than they are negative torque. They create a better rotation towards the target and they don't just turn away from the target forever and are not able to get back to that ball. And if, if they can't create this positive net impulse, I see a lot of issues start to show up with uh, issues of, of path and face control, of hands kind of getting in a good position. So what I want you to do with just some of those definitions uh, in the understanding, I actually want to hop in, and I think the best way to describe this is by looking at some swings, okay? So I'm going to start right here. And I think we're really trained well as golf coaches to the very first thing we look at is we look at the video of the golfer. And I think that's really informative, right? We have powerful ways to assess that video positions of those golfers. And so if we watch this player and we start to just look at maybe what his hips are doing in this plane of motion, okay? We see a player who's very powerful rotationally. He checks that box. But one other box that he checks really, really well is you can watch the way that pelvis start to move and create space and open and almost pull away from that ball as he's kind of getting into these positions in the downswing. A incredibly important aspect of this movement. What we need to understand with these anterior posterior forces or towards and away from the ball forces is that they're also creating the linear motion towards and away from the ball. So it's not just about who can create the most rotational torque. We also need to dive in and actually start to look at how much anterior posterior force are they creating from the trail leg in the red and the lead leg in the blue. Now our general rule of thumb is we wanna see twice as much force in the lead leg as it is in the trail leg. So this player is doing 41% of his body weight in lead leg anterior force, meaning his foot is pushing 41% of his body weight towards the ball, which creates this opening, mainly because we see that the total force at this point ends up being negative. Negative would tell us that that motion is moving away from the target. Now, what I like to do in these situations is I like to go even a little bit deeper, and I start to look at these impulse values. So not just when does that peak and how big is it, but what's the total quantity of motion linearly towards the ball and away from the ball? And this is a pattern I see in a lot of the really good players I work with, which when we look at these impulse values, we can see a, a negative 5.3 from the lead and a positive 1.9 from the trail, meaning our overall net impulse with a little bit extra from the trail gives us this negative 3.6. That means his tendency of motion, his quantity of motion linearly with that pelvis is gonna create that space and that opening. This is what we're looking for in that impulse value, okay? I like to start with a good example so that when we kind of pop into a scenario here, when we look at this video here and start to see a, a movement we probably see in a lot of our amateur golfers, where we're seeing that tendency of the pelvis to thrust towards the ball. And I heard Dr. Rose just uh, last hour talk about this idea of creating some slack kind of in the boat type principle, right? When we thrust towards the ball, that makes it really hard to deliver the club where we want. So if I dump it, jump in to his impulse values, I think you'll see a pattern that you often start to see in maybe some of the players that you're working with, which is a lot more trail side impulse and a lot less lead impulse, okay? You can see here that his trail negative impulse is only negative 0.6, where his lead impulse is a positive 2.7. That means his net impulse becomes 2.6. He's, he's literally creating all of this rotational torque from his trail leg, and so that's why we're getting kind of that thrust of the pelvis towards the ball instead of creating that space. So this impulse value right here can be really powerful. And you can see here that basically after this point, literally his lead leg stops pushing in that direction entirely, right? He's doing everything with the trail leg to create that motion. And now we get some of the things we start to see in video 
that we don't want to see in that golfer. Some of those movements of maybe some of the early extension and the kind of throwing the club out and around the body. Okay, so I think it's really important that we understand these anterior posterior forces are not just about the vertical torque. They're about linear motion in this plane as well. Okay? Now, I want to show you one of a player that I work with a lot at our university. Um, just to kind of dive in a little bit to uh, this torque graph. So some things that you can key in on the torque graph beyond just when it peaks and how big it is. Uh, but some things that we find in a lot of our really good players. So the first thing that I like to look at is when does this graph cross the zero? That's a real key indicator of a player that's not just generating a lot of power and speed, but also a player that is really consistent with the way they strike the ball. And you can see that this player crosses the zero uh, at about arm parallel on the backswing, right? Uh, I see really fast players do this even sooner, potentially. But he's doing a really nice job of that, right? We definitely like that he's creating a peak around arm 45 in the downswing. That's when we want that rotational torque to peak. Uh, and he does it with a good value of 102. And what you can see here, and this is one of my favorite new things to do with this vertical torque graph, the first thing I want to do is just set my time points as when the club starts to move and when he gets to impact and just compare these two values. And if I see more positive than negative, then I know his net impulse here would be 12, meaning more tendency of motion towards the target. Because when you start turning away from the target, the first thing you have to do is create kind of a stopping mechanism. You got to reverse those engines so that you can get things firing back towards the ball and towards the target. So this is where I first start. If they check the box of more positive than negative, the next thing I really like to do is I like to move backwards and say, well, when does this net impulse become zero? When are they creating as much positive as they are negative? And so I'll just start moving back in the graph and I'll literally just move this value until I see this become 13. 13 is his impulse or tendency of motion away. And I can just move through and find when does he end up in that position. And what I tend to, tend to see again in my really good players is they'll get to a net zero vertical impulse somewhere just after transition or even a little bit before that in the really good and fast players. Okay, that's an easy way for you to leverage this value of impulse to ensure that your players are reaching that net negative impulse prior to really late in the downswing. Okay, if they do this really late in the downswing, that looks like that player that turns forever and then just throws everything over the top and hopes they can kind of catch up to things. Okay, so this would be what I would say would be a really phenomenal example of this. I, I've become really excited about impulse, um, mainly because I think it's where we need to step into how we analyze some of this ground reaction force, right? Understanding not just how much, but, but what's the quantity of that force over a period of time. And so this is a player, uh, this is my uh, men's college golfer who's former college football or former high school football player, really good athlete. Uh, you can see here in that crevice there, his swing before this was a 123 club speed. He cruises about 125, 126. But his issue is, as we look at his lateral forces, as you can see, he's that player who gets a little bit lazy lateral in the backswing and then gets to the downswing and just shoves everything forward and then kind of tries to simultaneously brace himself while he's pushing forward as fast as he can. Now, at this point in his swing, he's generating a massive amount of vertical force, right? He peaks at, you know, two, I think his overall peak was like 243 in this swing. But he does quite a bit from that trail side, especially here in the swing. And what his issue was is his drives never got more than about 20 feet off the ground because his attack angle with the driver was like a negative three. And we were just trying to get him a little bit more lateral, a little bit more shift of the body forward so that he could leverage his big vertical push to actually kind of get that club moving up into the ball, okay? So I went into the lateral force. I said, hey, I love, I love that you do 36% of your body weight in lateral force. 
I just want you to do it like 10 frames earlier. I want you to produce this force a little bit earlier. So he was a player that we worked on some lateral jumping drills. Again, he was a quarterback, so I put a towel in his hand and had him load, step forward, and then swing the towel forward. Some drills he had done in his football day that really spoke to him a lot. I think what's important to understand, and actually I want to go quickly back here, because sometimes if we get so focused on just the value of the peak force and when it occurs, which again is very important, 36, we might miss something that we help the golfer do. So this was a player, his impulse was six positive and 2.7 positive total. So six from the trail, a total of 2.7. Uh, if I go to his post swing, and again, you can see this was after about 23 minutes of work. And I now go to his lateral force. Well, un unfortunately now, interestingly enough, I took his 38 and made it a 48, but I didn't move it any earlier in the swing. So initially I might say, man, we still got to work on timing. We got to get that moving a little bit faster. But when you go into his impulse data, what we can see is that six became an 11 and the 2.6 became about a 5.1. So we were able to double his impulse. He basically did that by engaging the legs more. He's creating more force earlier in that backswing. Now, what's really great about this for him is our goal was actually to take his vertical forces and see if we could get him doing a little bit more with his lead leg a little bit early in the swing to help his attack angle. So first two swings he took after this, and I bet uh, you coaches out there could easily guess, what he ended up saying is, man, Tyler, I feel like I'm hitting it low on the face. He loved to tee his ball low because he had that negative three down. So he's hitting it low on the face, the ball's going nowhere. And I said, okay, well, remember what we were trying to change. So what if we try just teeing your ball up just a little bit higher? And for him, that was about the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But I said, just trust me, let's just tee it a little bit higher. We teed it up a little bit higher and two balls in, all of a sudden his attack angle goes from negative three to about positive one. His launch angle improves and he got a 189.9 ball speed. He wanted a 190. We settled for 189.8. What was key for him is now his carry distance improved by 25 yards. Total distance maybe up 10, but carry distance by 25. Okay, and this was all by improving his forces, which improved some things in his body, which then carried out to the actual club itself, right? But again, the reminder here is that impulse can be a really powerful way for us to look at how we're changing motion. It's gonna create a larger quantity of motion. And even though his peak didn't improve in timing, he's producing more force in the backswing which actually allows him to create a better position for his body. So the, the kind of take home message of this is let's utilize what we know about impulse to play around a little bit more and, and be willing to kind of look at what they're doing over that time period and how that can improve their motion. The second one is to remember that as we look at vertical torque, make sure we're, tr we're not getting people who create a ton of turn away from the target. Uh, again, if we look at this player, I mentioned, again, super common in our really fast players. You can see how soon his torque goes positive. And the fact that he creates a very small quantity of motion away from the target, and he's able to create a large quantity of motion towards the target. Again, you're going to have players that are a little more rotational, and that's fine. But we want to see them create more of that quantity of motion towards and away from the target. And let's not forget that when we're talking about anterior, posterior forces, right, we also have to consider not just the rotational motion that comes from those, but also the associated linear motion. So keying in on lead leg anterior, posterior forces that are larger than our trail leg that can help open those hips and create a better position for that club delivery uh, for the golfer. So hopefully this gave you some things to think about. Um, uh, happy to kind of hang around and answer any questions anyone has and show you some more in the data.